a soldier came in the ghetto, a very high-ranking soldier, and he taught his people how to dish out the food for the Jewish people. And he said, do not dish it out before you don't spit in it. And this was in, in Hungary, Budapest, in Budapest, in the Jewish ghetto, in the Jewish ghetto, correct, in '44. In '44. Hi, I'm Sandy Scheller with the Chula Vista Heritage Museum and the South Bay Historical Society. And I am with Edith Palkowitz, who was a very, very dear friend of my mother. She's a Holocaust survivor. We're gonna be hearing her story. I'm gonna get out of the picture. Stay tuned. I'm not telling my story now. Do you really want me to? Edith? How much story you want? How far back can you remember? You're in your 90s. How far back? When I was three years old. Tell me. My mother died at the age of 23 on the operating room with, with a brain tumor. And who took care of you? I moved in with my grandmother. She wouldn't give me to my father who remarried, but I loved my stepmother very dearly. Mm -hmm. But my grandma raised me. The, we, the mirrors were always covered in our house because of memory of my mother. I thought every mirror has to be covered, but then I found out it's crazy. I mean, I grew up with covered mirrors. I was 12 when the Germans came in. Budapest, Budapest all right. we lived uh, in in the uh, Buddha, but when the Ger before the Germans came in, I moved in to Pest, which seven bridge are connecting the two cities. And the Germans came in. We had an uh, steps to where the uh, occupancy people used, and we had a, a delivery step, a, a circle step. And I'm going to my steps where I grew up, and a German guy, a Hungarian guy came in, and with a rifle said, you go to the other steps. So he pushed me down three flights. He hit me so hard that I got all my teeth out. I never had my teeth since I was 13. I had dentures all the time and implants. This is what I paid a little price. Then I got it into the ghetto and with my aunt. Which my ghetto? Budapest ghetto. People are not aware that soldiers made the walls again the, around the ghetto. I was there a year and a half in a two bedroom apartment. We were 24 people. We were pissing on each other, and we got used to it. What year? 1944, the beginning. I was there a year and a half, year and a half. In the winter time, I had no shoes. My leg was covered with newspaper, which melted in the snow. And then I was with my mother's sister, my aunt, Ella. If not her, I couldn't make it. Then somehow she got out of the walk. We walked every day. That's how you Jews should be. And people threw pots and pans and shoes and bricks on us when we were walking. And somehow she got out of the line with me. She had a beautiful story in Budapest like Bet and Bad and she had a good customer and she gave that customer gave her a cross a cross i don't think i ever saw a cross but that lady adored me mrs martin 
And she says, you just wear this, it's a beautiful jewelry. I never wore it, but I put it away in my purse. And about two years later, I took it out of, I see that the cross is in my purse. And somehow my aunt was pushed away from the line. And uh, Ella, where are you? Ella, where are you? She didn't answer me. I'm going all over looking for her like a crazy person, a crazy kid. I was 14 by then, 13 and a half. And uh, a soldier came over, a Hungarian soldier with his rifle pointed at me. What are you doing? You belong in the, uh, uh, with the Jews. And then I got so nervous that my purse fell out of my hand and the cross came out. Everybody calls this a miracle. And the soldier saw the cross and he said, just go. But where, where am I going? This Mrs. Martin lived far away. I had no money. I had nothing in my purse. And I was trying to go to Mrs. Martin. I went on the bus. I said, I'm a student. I don't have money. I had a fruit stand. And I, I said to the guy, is there any food what you cannot sell? And he went in the back and I stole some food. And I put it in my shirt. And he came back. He gave me some rotten prunes. But I ate it very happily and very gratefully. And then finally, about 8 o'clock at night, I found Mrs. Martin. I rang the bell, she opened the door, and she said, yes, who are you? She didn't recognize me. I said, I'm Chippy. Chippy was my nickname. It means little one. I said, I'm Chippy. You sure? Yes, I'm sure. So in the meantime, I went in there and she said, you're not going any place. You are staying with me. I'm not letting you out. I said, I'm not going to put you in risk with your children. You have to be safe. So she called a person and a person and a person, and they gave me a babysitting job with the postmaster's wife, five children, I went there as a babysitter. I became their sister. I became their mother. I adored them. They loved me so much. Every time the siren called, let's go down to the basement. One floor was occupied by the Russians, one floor occupied by the Hungarian, one floor occupied, I don't even by my home. And then about a few months later, we found out that the English people came in and said, and uh, the war is over. They saw how we looked. Did you believe it? When somebody comes to you after this horrendous torture, do you, if somebody came to you and said, you know, Edith, the, the war is over, how do you react to that? Well, I was numb. The children under me, the five children, they rather went with me than them with the mother. And uh, there was a few soldiers. All soldiers to me look alike because they're wearing the high sh boots, have the rifles, and this uh, thick khaki shirts. So was that an English soldier? Was it that a Hungarian soldier? But the good news was so good that I believed it. You did believe it. I did believe it. And then they took care of us, the soldiers, the English soldiers. What did they do? They washed us up. They gave us food. What year? It's 1945. Okay. Do you remember the month? In the spring. In the spring. Okay. And then, then only then I felt free. But I had no relatives living. Everybody was killed in the gas chamber. So I was alone. I said that I will not stay in this city 
there I have such a bad memories. Every house was injured and, and shoot, uh, shot as we were. So I went to the Jewish street, Ship Utsa 12, and I said, I'm alone. I can't stay here. Why can't you stay here? I don't want to. I want to get out to a free country. It's too much bad memory here. So they said, we don't have a consulate. You have to go to Paris, uh, England. So they took me to England, the Jewish Federation, alone, everything alone. There is a, a job waiting for you. And then I went into the hospital by a doctor. And I went, in, that I'm on some passing by, went into the hospital and he says, uh, you'll be fine, a Hungarian doctor. You'll be fine, we take good care of you, don't worry. And we went into the elevator and the next floor said big, big letters, the morgue. The morgue? The morgue. What is a morgue? Dead bodies. What am I going to do here? I'm going to dress up the morgue to bury you. And that's what I did for eight months. Then I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I went into London and I went to the consulate and I said, I want to, that was in London, I want to get out of it. Well, you have a job here. I'm not doing the job anymore. Well, then you have to go to Paris because from Paris it's easy to go to United States or to other countries. Make the long story very short. They, they visit with the train, they pushed me to put me to Paris, not put me, they put me on the train and I went to Paris. And I was there two years, sewing linings in the mink coats. All my fingers were bloody because the letter didn't let me go with the needle. My 10 fingers were bloody and, and bandaged up, but I had to do it. Uh, they only gave, the Jewish Federation only gave us housing and I was there with two Hungarian girls and we became sisters and she just died two years ago in Florida. She was hard on hearing, she lost her hearing aid and she bent down to find that and she hurt her head and that was it. Sorry to put this little thing in but it's very important to me. So I was in Paris for two years sewing linings. And then they told me, where do you want to go? I said, I don't care. I don't have any relatives anywhere. So we're going to go to the United States? Okay. So they put me on a ship, on a uh, Russian ship. The ship was so rough. And I, one day I was on it, I had to be in the hospital. What is a hospital on a Russian ship? A room with sheet and a cover and nobody there to feed you. No nurse, nothing. But a Russian lady felt sorry for me and she bought a bread and a drink. And I was, I think I was out of it very much. Three weeks had the journey. And then the Russian lady didn't come. Everybody leaves from the boat. What am I doing here in the hospital? I'm gonna sink. And then I see again a soldier with the high boots, with the rifle. As I said, every soldier to me looks the same. And then this, I said, who are you? I had very broken English. Who are you? But I spoke perfect German. And as you know, the German language is very much like English. I, I got through him and I said, who are you? He said, do you know where you are? I said, no, I have no idea. I'm in the hospital. I was about 80 pounds and he picked me up and he carried me out of the ship and he said, do you see what you have? The Lady of Liberty. And I don't know how, but I found myself kissing the ground. And I was so happy that Lady Liberty was so beautiful. I couldn't take my eyes off her. And then I said, I want to be here a little while. Okay, you'll be here. You're not leaving the United States. 
and they put me to Ellis Island for three months. The reason they put me, because this Russian ship was a spy ship. Nobody knew it except the Russians. And that was, that's why we had such a rough journey. I didn't speak to anyone for three weeks. I, didn't, I did not open my mouth. Do you remember the name of the ship? In a second. Chabator or Sabator. Sabator. Something like that. And uh, I went to Ellis Island and a lot of times interviewed and questions with uh, with uh, this espionage. Was in, this was in 46 or 47? Yeah, 47. In 47? I, I spent those years traveling there. Right. Do you remember the month? Do you remember? Yes, I remember that I went to July to Ellis Island. They took my name and before me somebody had a long name. They cut the, the uh, uh, Americans cut it half. Longer Schmidt? No, long. So people changed their names all the time. Mine was Edith Steiner, so it was nothing to change. And uh, I had to change my name because in England I had a passport. In France I have a passport. I was adopted with my, by my aunt because I had no mother. So my adopted name was Horner. And that's a very English name. H-O-R-N-E-R, -E Horner. And anyway, they, they questioned me why two names and why this and why that and what do I know? Where do I carry my espionage message? I didn't know what they were talking about. I was for three weeks in the hospital. I didn't know, I didn't speak with anyone. But it took three months to in investigation with everyone. And then my, a friend of the family who immigrated 20 years ago from the Bronx rented me a bed for $25 a month. And she said, you, sew, you are sewing so well, I'm gonna put you in a uh, garment factory. And she did. I didn't get paid for three months. How do I pay you the $25? Then I found out that shop wasn't a union shop. Went under and they didn't have to pay the workers. I swore I never work in a shop which is not unionized. So I went downtown and uh, I I lived in, uh, I got married to a wonderful uh, Czechoslovakian man named Sam who lost his whole family, seven of the six and brothers. They had a, 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 a grapeyard, a, a, a winery business. What city in Czechoslovakia? Ushara. Uh, uh, Ushara. Ushara. And he was very, very rich and strong and tall. And he was in, in I don't know which camp, but they couldn't wear him out. How so the last day, How I did didn't meet him. I didn't meet him. Oh, my husband? Yeah. Yes. My girlfriend, who I slept in the same room with in Paris, three of us was there doing that. She had a very rich uncle over here in, in uh, New York, over here. It's not over here, this is California. Uh, so the uncle made a New Year's party for the girls, for the refugees, who were 100 people. Uh, my sweet Olga, who was my sleeping buddy, came from Ushara. So everybody knew the Parkovitzes. So she said, Sam Parkovitz is here. If you could catch him, you'd be very lucky. She introduced him. Uh, I think it was love the first sight with him. I liked him right away. I felt secured with him. And that night I said, Sam, I have to take a bus, I have to take the subway. No, did. I drive you home. He had a Buick, a Buick. So he drove me home and that was a very nice uh, court relationship. He said, after a year, I would like to marry you. I said, I'm so young, 21 years old. Like, give me a chance. I wanted to go back to school, 
but I couldn't. I had to pay for my room after, not my bed, my room. And uh, Sam worked and went to a certified public accountant CPA school. And uh, he had a job, a grave job, grave hours in a delicatessen on Park Avenue. Uh, he was working from eight to eight. And he delivered breakfast on Park Avenue. Sometimes his tip was more than the order. So he had money, he helped me out. I had uh, an attorney bill because I got six months student visa here and that was expired. So I constantly went to the attorney to extend it. I had no money, he paid for it. So make the long story short, after two years we got married on my birthday. June 21, 1952. We had a one bedroom apartment in Yonkers. I was very happy. I worked. I worked walking five blocks, take the bus, take two subways, and get to the garment factory. I was very successful there. Then I was married already, and Sam wanted at least 10 children. I had a miscarriage, then I had my son, then I had a miscarriage, and then I had my daughter, and then I had a miscarriage. So my gynecologist said, this is it. We're not going any further. And he took care of me. And Sam wasn't happy. I wanted to adopt a child. He said, the genes of an adopted child you never know. You will raise that child beautifully, but the genes you cannot help. I do not want an adopted child. So we had two children, wonderful two children. Yesterday I told somebody, I don't know who, I never yelled at my children. Sure, I never hit them. They said, mommy cannot hear us. Mommy was beaten and I could never hit them, but they didn't need the punishment. They were wonderful. It's a gift from God, these two children, Elizabeth and Arthur. I said, I name you closest to the monarchy, Queen Elizabeth and King Arthur. And we lived our life in America, which was wonderful. Very successful life, very accomplished life. Arthur came to law school to San Diego. He says, Mom, I will come back to visit you, but I will never come back to live in Yonkers. He was born with bronchitis, first eczema and then bronchitis. So in, in San Diego, he felt fine. In uh, Yonkers, he was always coughing and coughing and colds and coughing and ear infection and whatnot. And he had to go to the baby doctor, to the pediatrician. And uh, we came, uh, I said, Sam, I'm going to live where Arthur lives. I don't know what the hell it is. And Liz is gonna come with me. Liz had a boyfriend. She didn't wanna come. She says, I'm 18, I don't have to come. I said, you just, you do. You come, because the only three of us, Arthur, Daddy, me. So what am I gonna do with my fourth finger? I won't have any fourth finger. So you come. So the, all of us, Sam didn't want to come. He was a member in a temple for 40 years. He didn't want to give up his uh, Rosh Hashanah chair and his Yom Kippur chair. He said, I'm not going to America. What kind of a Mishikaz is that? I should leave. And uh, I said, ah, Sam, I'm going with Liz. Arthur is there already. Think about it. I took the next flight out. I applied for real estate license. And so did Liz, I made her after 18 years old. I said, with that you could always get a job. She told yesterday to somebody, my mother made me take the real estate uh, exam. I'm so sorry, my speaking is not that easy for me. Perfect. Anyway, so we, uh, we came to America, the three of us, and then Sam said, what am I gonna do here alone? He come back helped me pack up the house. We lived there 32 years. There was a lot of packing and a lot of giving away. 
and in 1988 we all were in Lake Murray in San Diego. I bought a little condo and we were there. Arthur took his exam, he passed. We, we, Liz and I printed out the note. I just passed the bar, I take any case. And we went down to the, uh, uh, where the soldiers live and we put on every car this flyer. He got clients galore, galore. And then he became a very important attorney. Now he does civil cases the next 40 years. And uh, this is where we are. We joined Batam. When it wasn't Batam yet, it was on Stevens Avenue. Uh, uh, car tire place, uh, 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 nothing. I joined then, so that was like 35 years ago. I was never religious, I, but being belonged to a temple was very important to me. And then they went to uh, here and they went to the beautiful temple, over a million dollars worth at that time. And uh, the rabbi just called me I want to come and visit you because his grandmother was Hungarian and he said no you my grandmother and I want to speak to you I want to he was insulted that I didn't let him come to the hospital I couldn't I wasn't feeling well I didn't want him to see me like this and he says I don't care how you look I just want to see you that in the past year and this year a total of 11 times I was hospitalized 11 11 times between 20 and 21 all different things but I'm here with now with you Sandy and I'm doing my best to give you uh, my life story I left out a lot a lot of things I skipped years and years and years because it was unpleasant it was a terrible experience uh, all my grandchildren heard, heard this story when I speak it depends on the audience, how old they are, how much can they comprehend, how much are ab they able to understand. But just like with them, I'm going to do the same thing with you. There is two things I want to emphasize. One, that knowledge is power. On 2nd uh, 46th Street in the library, it says with big letters, knowledge is power. The other one I'm going to tell you, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, treat people as you want to be treated. God bless everybody. Can I ask you another question? What does New Life Club mean to you? My new club meant to me Budapest. There were few Hungarians there, but by then I was very good in English because my husband wouldn't allow speaking Hungarian or Czech at home, just English, because he hated them so much to destroy his family that he couldn't hear the language. So I had an advanced time to speak English. Everybody said, you hear 20, 30 years, you speak very well English. My uh, Hungarian accent or my New York accent, I will never lose. But they say it's cute. Do you speak Hungarian? I self again. Yes, I to do. People in the new life yes, club? I do. Okay. I speak German fluently. Mm -hmm. I speak Hungarian and a bit of Yiddish. And uh, they said, "You hear so long. Arms not long, and I have such a heavy accent." And I say, "How did you speak home?" Oh, Hungarian. But we spoke only English. And I went to an English school. I have two years of college certification on experiencing in life. It's not probably experiencing, experience in life. So to me, grammar is very important. Edith, tell me what I need to know to help Holocaust survivors to preserve the legacy. Are we doing the right thing, the second generation? You're doing much more than anybody has the right or the privilege to experience. 
second generation is a gifted people out of you, Stephen Schindler, mm -hmm. out of uh, Hannah, the uh, Jewish Federation president, uh, everybody who takes care of wounded animals. We are animals. We very little close to animals. We are wounded. Every inch of our body. I'm not talking about sickness. I'm talking about hurt. And if you guys acknowledge that and tell it to your children and leave memorials like we went Sunday to unveil, that's the thing you have to do. I did public speaking for 25 years. I never said no. I was in prison. I was in the church. I was in hospital. I was in veterans hospital. And then I was in a jail where 14 years, 15 years old girl was pregnant. So the government made a deal with them. We take care of your children and it's called a life. That, that, that project. And that project, I was invited to speak. And they were just crying. The children were the whole day away. They went to school the whole day. They get the high school diploma paid and everything, and the taking care of the children are paid. And I went to speak there, and the reporter was there, the newspaper reporter. I have that article. And she said, not a dry eyes were there when Edith was finished, including me. Edith, are you getting what you need, not just as somebody who's um, in her golden years, but are you getting everything that you need spiritually, physically, emotionally? What is missing that we can try to make a difference so that's in your life? Emotionally, physically, financially. My husband was sick for many years. A lot of my money was spent on it. I gave him the best, best years I could. If the organization like Jewish Federation, Jewish Family Service, as a Holocaust survivor, as a 92-year-old woman, need caregiving. I'm going to ask you a question. You're such a giving woman. You have been so good to everybody you meet. Your family, me, people in the New Life Club. I see when you walk in the room, everybody cries and they're like, hey, there's Edith. This they're in a, a line there. <laughs> yeah, they, they, it's a line. Yeah, absolutely. My son said he's like the Pope. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Are you good at receiving? Are you good at when people give you things? Is it hard for you? It's not hard for me because I love it. But it's hard for me to reciprocate. You see how I speak English? Mm -hmm. I love it. I, it's hard. I want to give them everything, what they gave me. And I accomplished that. But remember my speeches, how I close my speeches. Knowledge is power and be with people like, treat people like you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. Edith, thanks so much for you. your interview. Oh my gosh, this is what happens when you get vaccinated for the third time. I did too. Anyway, we're gonna say thanks for watching. Our lives are future. I'm with Edith Palkowitz, and with that, we're gonna say bye. Bye-bye. God bless you. <laughs>